It's my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce to you Dr. Erling C.J. Norby, Secretary General of the Royal Swedish Academy of Science in Stockholm, speaking perhaps as the ultimate insider on a century of Nobel Prizes. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences is an institution that annually selects the Nobel Prizes, uh, the awardees for those prizes, both in the traditional fields of physics and chemistry and in the more recently established prize in honor of Alfred Nobel in the area of economics. Prior to leading the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and taking on the responsibility and honor of serving as one of seven directors on the board of the Nobel Foundation, Dr. Norby chaired the Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute, which awards the prize in his own field of research and teaching, namely uh, physiology or medicine. In brief, Dr. Erling Norby has intimate knowledge about the criteria and the process by which all the Nobel Prizes awarded in Sweden are annually selected, and has himself played a role in the selection of a number of Nobel Prize awardees. In light of the manner in which Alfred Nobel's original vision has had been realized over these past hundred years, it is important to stress that Erling Norby has his own very distinguished career in viral medicine at Stockholm's Karolinska Institute, one of the world's leading medical research and treatment centers. He is a world-renowned virologist who has published in excess of 400 papers. For more than 20 years, he served the Nobel Committee of Karolinska Institute before his 1990 selection as chair of the Nobel Assembly. Hence, as one of Sweden's, indeed the world's leading medical researchers, he had direct knowledge of advances in that field and I suspect he has known the individual prize Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize awardees personally in, ph in physiology or medicine and also has known the significance of their work uh, for the past 30 years at least. He is presently interested in general uh, helping people to understand science and also to understand uh, the advancement and to further the advancement of science and to understand the significance for the modern world. Again, in addition to his key leadership roles on the Nobel Prize selection committees and for the past four years on the Nobel Foundation Board, Erling Norby is known and respected as a worldwide premier scientist. It is an honor to be able to invite Dr. Erling C.J. Norby to address the 37th Nobel Conference at Gustavus on the topic, A Century of Nobel Prizes. Dr. Norby. Thank you very much, Professor Stroy, for this kind introduction. And let me first express to the organizers uh, my thankfulness for being invited to come here and share these joyful events with you all. Uh, I must say I'm very impressed by the remarkable arrangements that have been made here. And of course, it's a special feeling to address such a large audience and with about 17 Swedish and 17 American flags surrounding you. Um, in particular, it's a joy to see all your young people here uh, in the audience. The Nobel Prize is, is a unique institution. At the time when uh, it was conceived, it was the largest prize ever, and it was international. And over the years, it has acquired the status of being an exceptional measure of scientific quality. And since in this year, 2001, it is 100 years since the first Nobel Prize recipients were elected. It may be appropriate to consider what we can learn from examining the selection process, the anointed scientist, and the discoveries that have been made. First, some words about the man, Alfred Nobel. Alfred Nobel was born in 1833, and he was a third of four surviving brothers out of originally six children. All four boys that survived showed considerable talent, and it's very easy to get distracted and elaborate at length about the history of the Nobel family. The dynamic father, he was a self-taught engineer and businessman who moved with his family to St. Petersburg when Alfred was nine years old. 
The older brothers, they were trained as engineers, but Alfred got a training in chemistry. He was very quick in learning and managed five languages fluently when he was about 17 years old. And if I can get start my PowerPoint presentation, you see the picture of Alfred Nobel coming up here. And um, the, it's about the age of many of you who are here in the auditorium, so you may think about where he was in his developments. So when he was 17 years old, he was sent abroad for two years to Germany, France, Italy, and North America. And in Italy, he worked in the famous laboratory of Professor T.J. Pelouse, where he met a young scientist by the name of Arcanio Sobrero, who had developed an explosive oil named nitroglycerin. And Alfred saw the potential uh, of uh, this the design, and he developed a new design for practical uses for which he got a patent in 1863. And this product was later named dynamite. And at his death, 33 years later, Nobel had 355 patents registered in his name. In the same year of 1863, when he got this first patent, the family, except the two older brothers, were back in Stockholm after that the father had been forced into another bankruptcy of his, for a while, very successful business in St. Petersburg. So the family started a factory for production of explosives, but it was again hit with a tragedy. A major explosion occurred in a storehouse, killing the youngest Nobel brother and four other people. Alfred Nobel, however, carried on his work with explosives and initiated a fantastic career as an international industrialist and inventor. And it certainly changed our world at that time by improving various means of communication, using the dynamite to development of roads, tunnels, channels, uh, you, railways, you, you name it. So he established factories in many countries, but he preferred himself to live in France. He also did have a home in Sweden, but his life was one of very restless activities. He was a very lonely person who never married, and his views on life were generally said to be quite dark. Now, to bestow honors is a tradition in academies and learned society. And thus, also, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, almost since its beginning in 1739, instituted prizes and distributed medals. The awards were meant as an encouragement, and they did not really serve as a support for science. In fact, our academy recognized the contribution by Alfred Nobel and his father by giving them in 1868 the Lettestets Prize for their discovery of dynamite. The amount was 400 Swedish crowns, which is a sizable sum at that time, but presumably not impressive by Nobel's uh, standard. Some years later, Alfred Nobel was again recognized by the Academy. He was elected a member in March 1884. And interestingly, he was elected a member in the class of economics, and furthermore, as a foreign member. His election as a foreign member probably reflected the fact that he lived essentially his whole life outside Sweden. Apparently, he saw the attention given by the Academy as an encouragement, and he kept it in mind when he wrote his famous will. So Alfred Nobel wrote his final will in November 1895. It was written in Swedish and deposited in a Swedish bank. And he wrote it without any legal assistance. And as a result, there were, of course, a number of formal defects which led to a series of complications before the will eventually could be implemented. So Alfred Nobel had no immediate heirs. His closest relatives were two nephews, one living in Sweden and one living in Russia. And when the will was opened, five days after Nobel's death, 63 years old, on December 10, 1896, the relatives learned to their dismay that only a limited portion of the estate was bequeathed to them. So why then was it Nobel's wish that his estate should be used for prizes? It is said that his political views had a socialistic color and that he did not sympathize with transfer of wealth between generations. Since he himself, as was mentioned, was a true inventor, he could appreciate the importance of providing creative conditions for young, talented inventors. 
and his concept was simple. The prize to be given should allow the awardee to concentrate on his work without any need for income for some 20 years. So really a long-range scholarship. The five equal parts of the financial returns of the endowment should be given to, and let's list this, to the one who in the field of physics has made the most important discovery or invention. Or secondly, to the one who in the field of chemistry has made the most important discovery or improvement. Thirdly, to the one who was in the makes the most important discovery in the domain of physiology or medicine. And not listed on this, this picture. Fourthly, to the one who in literature has produced the most outstanding contribution with an idealistic orientation. And finally, to the one who has worked the most or the best for fraternization between peoples and elimination or reduction of standing armies and formation and dissemination of peace congresses. Now the common denominator for the first three prizes that you see on this picture is the term discovery. Thus, prizes are not given for life contributions to science, but for making a single discovery with a huge impact. Only in a few cases is it possible to identify prizes in which a particular reference has been given to the word invention or improvement, that it says in, in, in uh, physics and chemistry. Still, in the early year, there were prizes in physics that were given to invention, like to Lippmann in 1908 for the color photography technique, to Marconi and Brown in 1909 for radio transmission, and to the Swede Dahlén in 1912 for automatic regulators in lighthouses. But later prizes most often have gone to discoveries in basic sciences. Interestingly, the year 2000, both the committees for physics and chemistry uh, properly proposed candidates in fields of more applied science, that is, the integrated circuits and conductive polymers. Now, the prize awarding institutions that are named in the will were for physics and chemistry, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. For physiology or medicine, the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, which is a school of medicine, and for literature, the Academy of Letters in Stockholm, and for peace, a five-member committee selected by the Norwegian House of Parliament, the Stortinget. And in this context, it should be mentioned then that Sweden and Norway formed a union until 1905, when it was peacefully resolved. However, of course, engagement in Nobel Prizes has remained a continued shared responsibility of the two countries. And uh, there is a Norwegian representative in the board of the Nobel Foundation. Nobel's choice of the five fields has been a matter of many discussions. It's said that he originally considered to bequest his estate to the newly established University of Stockholm. But there were certain frictions with a very colorful president of this institution, the mathematician Mittag Leffler. And that may have made him change his mind, and perhaps they, they also made him exclude mathematics. However, interestingly, Mittag Leffler himself, he bequeathed his estate to the Academy, Academy which now represents the world-famous institution for mathematics under R.E. Gies. The inclusion of literature may reflect Nobel's own engagement in that field. He made some, and we must, may, must admit that, some rather unsuccessful attempts to, in his own to write poems and fiction. And towards the end of his life, he even wrote a drama that entitled Nemesis, which he had printed on his own cost. But after his death, the relatives made sure that all the copies of the book actually were destroyed, except one that's still in existence. Perhaps the suffix with idealistic orientation reflects his belief that literature in his opinion, is a means of changing our world. And uh, the idealistic focus is, of course, also apparent in the beginning of the will, in which it says that the awardees should, and I quote, have made the greatest contribution to mankind. When it comes to peace prizes, it's likely that he was inspired by his acquaintance with the Austrian pacifist Bertha von Sutter, who he for a while had employed as his private secretary. This doesn't mean that he shared her ideas, but he indeed respected her 
and in 1905, she herself received the Peace Prize. So what about the implementation of the will? Now, there were many roadblocks to be removed before the will of Alfred Nobel could be fully implemented. There were legal formalities such as the jurisdiction over the will, and furthermore, there existed no legal or organized structure to take responsibility for the fund. Nobel's relatives living in Sweden wanted to take advantage of the situation of uncertainty, and they contested the will in 1898. However, the nephew Emmanuel, representing the Russian branch of the family, he supported a resolution in accordance with his uncle's will. In fact, he even had an argument with the Swedish king Oscar II about the interpretation of the will, because the king in the prevailing mood of the time of national chauvinism did not like the formulation in the will that, and I quote, no consideration whatever shall be given to the nationality of the candidates, but that the most worthy shall receive the prizes, whether he's Scandinavian or not, end of quote. So eventually a settlement was made with the relatives who got minor compensation, and Emmanuel in his own right, he became a member of our academy in 1911 in what was then a class for economy, statistics, and social sciences. But even the prize awarding institutions brought in complicated matters. In fact, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences created for a while, uh, like a moment, 22 situation by stating that it was willing to accept responsibilities of being an awarding institution, provided that there was an institution which allowed the establishment of the fund. But such an institution could only be established if the academy accepted its task. The critical resolution of the matter was the establishment of the Nobel Foundation. And this was an idea conceived by the young engineer Ragnar Sulman, one of the two executives of the will. And this foundation, the Nobel Foundation, was instituted on June 29, 1900. And the Nobel Foundation is an underlying coordination organization, managing the funds, fulfilling legal functions, and arranging the famous prize ceremony in Stockholm. However, in all justice, it should be emphasized that it is not the Nobel Foundation that give Nobel prizes, but it is the awarding institutions that carry the sole responsibility for selecting prize recipients. And take notes, I prefer to use the word recipients, not winners, because I don't think you win Nobel prizes. And it's also the uh, awarding institutions that give the prizes. And a few words on the prize in economy, and on my headline is in fact that the prize in economy is not a Nobel Prize. So in the end of the 1960s, the Central Swedish Bank had a centennial celebration. And um, it then decided to donate an annual sum of money to the Nobel Foundation in order to allow the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences to give a prize in economics. Our academy has a class for economics and social sciences. So this proposal was accepted by the academy and by the Nobel Foundation. And since 1969, there is a prize in economy in memory of Alfred Nobel. And thus, of course, this does not celebrate 100 years at, until in many years from now. It is, of course, difficult for the public to distinguish the prize in economy from true Nobel Prizes, since it's processed at our academy in the same way as Nobel Prizes, and furthermore, since it has become affiliated with the Nobel Prize ceremony in the concert hall in Stockholm on December 10th. So, how many prize recipients uh, can there be when you select uh, the laureates for a certain year? It wasn't really clear from the will if the prize awarding institution should aim at selecting a single recipient or if there could be more than one prize recipient. Uh, originally, the possibility of, of allowing a split into three prizes per discipline was considered, but eventually it also was decided that there could be a maximum of two distinct prizes. So one can give prizes within, for example, physics to two distinct fields of physics. Well, it was furthermore not originally regulated whether a single prize could be shared by one, two, or more recipients. And this was not clearly settled until 1968, when a firm rule was introduced that there can be a maximum of three prize recipients in one discipline at the same time. So 
This evidently again gives five different possibilities. A price can be given for a single discovery to one person or shared equally between two or three persons. Alternatively, a price can be given for two, two distinct discoveries. One half the price may go to one recipient and the other to another. But one half of the price may also be shared between two individuals, giving a total of three recipients. Of course, a single individual can receive repeated honors, such as the prize in physics to Bardeen in 1956 and 1972, and as already alluded to earlier today, the prize in chemistry to Sanger in 1958 and 1980. There's also the possibility of receiving repeated honors in different fields, such as Marie Curie's prizes in physics in 1903 and in chemistry in 1911, and Pauling's prizes in chemistry in 54 and in peace in 1962. A Nobel Prize need not be given to uh, individuals. It can also be given to institutions. And this possibility has only been used for the Peace Prize, which on several occasions have been given to institutions. One example is the Red Cross, which in fact has received more than two prizes. In principle, it is also possible to give prizes in the natural science field to institutions, but that has not been used. So what... Uh, does the record of the preceding century show as concerns selection of one, two, or three recipients in the fields of physics, chemistry, and physiology, or medicine? And I'm not sure you can see that in the way in the back of the room, but let me summarize what, what can be seen here. First of all, uh, Nobel Prize have not been given all the years. Due to World War perturbances, there were six years in which no prizes in physics were given, eight years were without price in chemistry, and nine years without prices in physiology and medicine. But for the remaining years, one can see here that in fixed physics during the first 50 years, there was predominantly single price recipients. But there is also a fair number of uh, shared prices. And after the Second World War, the prices are sh that are shared increased rapidly when they are shared between both two or three recipients. It seems, however, that now we have reached some form of steady state. So the last decades, there has been about the same portions between uh, single and double and triple prize winners in, in physics. Uh, this is of interest to consider because it's frequently argued that since modern physics in many areas to an increasing extent is carried out in teams and large teams, that sometimes with many, many hundred collaborators, it would be harder and harder to single out individuals. This is probably not true. My belief is this, that there is always in a team uh, a single or a few individuals that really leads the group, that spearheads the group. Also in chemistry you can see that for the first 10 years there was only a single price recipient and later on an increasing number of, of price double price recipients or even triple price recipients. And again, in the last decades, they seem to stabilize with about, same, about four price, single price recipients, two to three double price recipients, and three to four triple price recipients. Physiology or medicine is the field in which over time the largest proportion of price has been given to uh, three individuals. In fact, in 29% of all the cases. However, it seems that the propensity towards selecting three price recipients is not increasing with time during the last decades. Thus, even in a field with a multidisciplinary nature like medicine, there is frequently the, in the single individual or a few individuals who make the difference in paradigmatic advances. So let me tell you a little about how we select Nobel Prize recipients. And I will discuss only the selection of price recipients in physics, chemistry, and physiology or medicine, of which I have, as was mentioned, personal experience. I can just imagine that the price work in literature and in peace in many regards are different and that they include certainly uniquely and rather inher uniquely inherent problems. However, it applies to all prizes that a candidate that can be considered shall be freshly nominated before January 31 for the prize the same year. So in fact the Nobel work goes on through the whole year and we select uh, and send out invitations to nominate during the autumn. And nominations will be in before the end of January. 
There may of course be situations sometimes when a particular hot candidate does not receive any outside nomination. And it's possible in such a case that the, the secretary of the committee can secure a nomination so that the candidate is included in the discussions. So only designated individuals can have the right to nominate and institutions cannot make nominations. Examples of such designated individuals are professors in the particular field in Scandinavia and previous prize recipients. In addition, the committee separately invites individuals globally representing academies or university institutions on a rotating basis. And the total number of invitations that are being sent out is in the range of two to three thousand. And the number of nominations for the last decades have been ranging between 200 and 400. Roughly 10 to uh, 10, 20 percent of the nominations are new to the committee, but obviously most names have been encountered in the preceding work. And let me emphasize that this is an ongoing work that, that you pick up in the particular year from the preceding years, and, and, and the whole process is one in which the, the, the price in a certain area matures with time. Now, the rules specify that there should be a committee composed of five members elected for a time period of th three years, and that the Karolinska Institute, uh, the members may be re-elected once, and at the Academy, they can be re-elected twice and serve for nine years. Or not. Now, the working committee can be enlarged by uh, electing adjunct members on a one-year basis, and at the Academy, we only use a relatively small number of such adjunct members. And the reason for this is that the Academy has, in, at the Academy, the committee interacts with a class of Swedish members representing the field, like the class of physics. And such a class has about 35 members, out of which 18 are below the age of 65. Uh, but also, the members of a certain committee need not be recruited from the class. They can be taken from other classes where uh, the, you have a particular competence. Now, the goal in the selection process is to accumulate the best in-depth competence representing the range uh, of the field as, as well as possible. It should be remarked that uh, the, whereas the Academy represents the whole Sweden, the Karolinska Institute is only one of six faculties of medicine in Sweden, although they manage about one-third of all biomedical research in Sweden. At the Karolinska Institute, the decision about the prize originally was taken by the College of Teachers with a lifelong tenure. But then there were changes in the rules for ob obligatory disclosure of official documents, and, uh, and Karolinska Institute is, is a state-run uh, university. And then one had to form a new legal entity, which was done in the 1970s, and this is a so-called Nobel Assembly, which is, a pri legally speaking, a private institution. This assembly has 50 members, and it continually, continuously renews itself as members retire or leave the Karolinska Institute. The working committee in physiology and medicine, in medicine includes, since many years, 10 members adjuncted for individual years. And this committee, a total of 15 people, interacts with and reports to the Nobel Assembly, which takes the final decision, usually on the second Monday in October. So this coming Monday, you will hear who has received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for the year 2001. So to return to the academies, we have what you may call it a three-tier system. So there's the committee, there's the class, but the decision is taken by all the members of the academy, which are on paper about 350 members. And we usually assemble between 120, 130 of our members for this important uh, uh, decision. And uh, that um, uh, we, we can also pay for the travel of members, and, and, and it's a day of full of excitement. And this will come up now the co coming week, so on Tuesday we will present the prize recipient in physics. And for the first time we now move the announcement of the prize recipients in chemistry to the following day. Previously we announced physics and chemistry on the same day, so that will be the coming Wednesday. And just to highlight that uh, it's a unique situation where first the, the chairman of the Nobel C Committee describes the whole process that have, how all the deliberations have been made, reviews all the different fields of the particular discipline, and, uh, and tells, where all, tells about where all the hot candidates are. 
And then after that, the committee comes with a proposal that has been supported by the class for a particular prize recipient of the year. And then there's another member, usually of the committee, who gives an in-depth description of the, what the, prize, the proposed prize recipients have made. And this is a unique information, uh, both to those who are active in the field, but also, of course, those that are outside the field. So all, if we go back a little to how the process works, uh, of course all nominations are, are reviewed very carefully, but most of them have already been counted in previous work. And uh, those that are newly nominated, they may be selected in a number of cases for separate reviews, either on a kind of preliminary review or an, an in-depth analysis. But they may also be put aside with a note to the protocol, it depends on how, how heavy they, they, they will weigh. Now, the reviews can have very different penetrations, and, and it, uh, here there are somewhat different systems at the Karolinska Institute and at the Academy. And the Academy very often makes reviews of fields of, uh, with all the different candidates, and even has started during later years to have hearings uh, with people that, that are well familiar with this particular important field of science. The reviewers that are being used, of course, can be taken from the committee, uh, but also taken from uh, reviews from outside, both of national and international origin. And uh, towards the end of August each year, so all these reviews that have been accumulating during uh, the springtime and, and, and summer are collected in a book volume, which at the Karolinska Institute is used for the final discussion between the committee and the assembly, and at the academy, the collection of reviews is supplemented with a written comparative evaluation by the committee of the strength of candidates and actually ends up with a proposal for a single uh, prize. Now these yearly book volumes represent a fantastic real-time analysis uh, of events in advancement of science of, of potential historical relevance. Because the goal, of course, of the selection process for the Nobel Prize recipients is to identify uh, contributions representing milestones in the history of science. And the exceptional renome of the prize is, of course, ba based on the fact that the recipients selected during the preceding century has been, if not flawless, very close to this. Remarkably few of the selected candidates in natural sciences and their contributions have not stood the test of time. And it is this simple fact that gives the prize its extraordinary international prestige. The prize simply does reflect the history of modern science. Now the part of the will which has not been possible to fulfill is that the prizes shall be given, and I quote, to those who during the preceding year have, and I end quote. So in practice this requirement has been interpreted to mean that the impact of the contribution has be, that to be awarded has been fully appreciated during the preceding year. And as a consequence, discoveries to be honored generally have been made some 10 to 20 years before the year of, of awarding the prize. In fact, there are examples of uh, even longer time lags, even as long as 50 years when Peyton Rouse got his prize in 1966 for his discovery of tumor-inducing viruses based on findings that he made in the 1920s. The few mistakes that have been made frequently represent a too rush recommendation for a prize by a committee. Now another part of the will that requires continuous deliberation is that the contribution shall be beneficial to mankind. The way the committee historically have interpreted, interpreted this in their penetrating work is that high quality basic research in one way or the other uh, results in discoveries that markedly advance our civilization. However, the tasks for committees may become more and more challenging. The number of scientists engaged in research has increased markedly with time. The number of paradigmatic discoveries probably also increased as a consequence. And possibly, therefore, uh, more consideration may have to be given to the timelessness of a particular prize in the future. And uh, the selection from this large number of scientists that are out there, of course, it means uh, more and more comprehensive work. 
One critical aspect of the price selection process is the secrecy. So the process for the, the selection of price recipients is surrounded by highly developed secrecy. And this is a prerequisite to endow the process with as high a degree as objectivity as is possible in human endeavors. Thus, lobbying is useless in affairs that concern Nobel Prizes. If anything, I believe such actions may have a negative effect. After a time lag of 50 years, the archives of the Nobel Committees become available for scholarly investigations. The richness of the archives shows some increase with time, and studies of them, therefore, may become progressively more rewarding. However, since the protocols of the committee meetings only include the decisions, the reasons for certain deliberations may not be apparent from the archives. During the more than 20 years from 1974 and onwards when I had the privilege of being engaged in the work of the Nobel Prize Committee at the Karnisky Institute, it was a tradition that the secretary took personal notes besides the protocol. And I think these notes may provide very interesting information in the future. And I have in fact encouraged our present secretaries of the committees for physics and for chemistry to also take personal notes. Of course, accepting then that they are personal notes. What about nationality of uh, Nobel Prize recipients? The um, total number of persons that have received Nobel Prize in physics, chemistry, or physiology and medicine during the previous century is 469. And among these, scientists doing their work in the United States dominate more than 40% of the total. And in physics and in physiology and medicine, the figures are close to 50%, whereas in chemistry, they are, of course, somewhat lower. The figures for prizes in different disciplines given to scientists from Great Britain and Germany are similar. However, with a clear dominance for Great Britain when it comes to physiology or physics and physiology or medicine. If instead uh, one divides this uh, nationality counting on 25 year time periods, it becomes apparent that the good position for Germany was high, is highly influenced by the awards that were given before the Second World War. Whereas the United States, has, since the Second World War, has taken an exceptional lead. During the last 50 years, more than 70% of all prizes in natural sciences have gone to the United States. And it is, of course, an interesting question if this country, or your country, can retain this dominance of global science in the future. It's quite a challenge. Of course, a prize means that you also get some money. And Nobel Prize recipients, they do receive a large sum of money. However, the absolute value of the prize has varied markedly. It had its lowest relative uh, value after the First World War, where only about 28% or even down to 20% of the uh, original value. During the last decades, the price has recovered its value, and when we had the celebration in 1991, for 90 years after uh, the first Nobel Prize, it was back to its original monetary value. Uh, so during the last decade, the price has recovered and started to exceed its original value, and uh, the foreboding is that one will be able to increase the relative sum with time. During the, the preceding year, the, the Board of Foundation decides the price value for a certain year in Swedish crowns, and for the year 2001, the value is somewhat less than one million US dollars. Now, in part of the explanation for the improved value of the price is that since the 1950s, but not before that, the foundation is allowed to invest money in safe security, not only in safe security, but also in stocks. And the total value of the assets of the Nobel Foundation in real terms is almost three times that of the original value. The yearly yield from the capital is used not only for prices, although close to 60% of the returns should be used for, price, for the prices, but also to pay for the work performed by the committees and uh, other employees at the price-giving institutions and also for the prize ceremony and for the employees of the Nobel Foundation. However, as I think I've already emphasized, it's not 
the money really that gives the prize its prestige. To receive a Nobel Prize is an unmatched honor, which brings an unprecedented respect and recognition from colleagues. The fact is further accentuated by the fact that, as was mentioned, on the one hand, the number of